celebrate oh, benefits. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I love it. All right, we are recording. Do we want to give it another minute or two for more people? Do we have folks joining remotely as well? We so. don't. We're just doing the record. If that's okay, we're just doing the recording because we have 30 people registered. Yeah. And so, and like, it's, there are students. And so, life is busy. Totally get yeah. it. And so, we'll send them the recording when they're all gone. Awesome. <laughs> So I guess we can kick it off. Hey everyone, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, I know it's quite busy with uh, finals and graduation. I guess what what years are you guys? I'm a freshman. Oh, awesome. What about you guys? I'm a freshman. Oh my god, nice. I'm a freshman. Okay, cool. Yes, yeah, so am I. Oh, exciting. Oh, awesome. Okay. Nice range. Well, um, thanks again for coming by. We're gonna do a skills assessment. We're gonna be talking to you all about Choco slash sales at Choco. Um, we'd love to do just a couple intros. Uh, myself, my name's Zach. I'm a recruiter at Choco. I'm joined with Anne Murray, who is a uh, DePaul alumni and a South associate. Um, Chris, who is our head of inside sales, head of buyer for our business. And then my colleague, Soyil, as well, who is on my recruiting team. So uh, that's who's going to be speaking to you today. Um, next slide, please. We'd love to give you a rundown of what's Choco. So we are the largest ordering platform uh, for restaurants, uh, connecting restaurants directly with their suppliers. For, and we have two different products. For restaurants, Choco is a free mobile app that lets chef and managers order and chat with their suppliers, basically ordering inventory for their kitchen. Um, and for suppliers, Choco is a web mobile app um, that allows them to manage their customer relationships as well as orders that they're receiving as a vendor. Um, I have a quick little video to kind of give you guys a rundown of how we work for restaurants. Um, Choco lets chefs and managers order from all their suppliers in one app. Here's how it works. When you open the app, you'll see all your suppliers on one screen. You click on any of them see a simple group chat with your team and your sales rep. To make a new order, you click the shopping cart to see your digital order guide for that supplier. First, you go down the list and pick the products you need. Next, you add a delivery date and any other comment. When everything is ready, you tap to send. Your supplier gets your order with all the information they need and the way they want to receive it, via email, text, WhatsApp, or directly to their ERP system. You'll get notified when your order is confirmed. Join over 15,000 chefs and managers for easier ordering with Choco. So Choco, we're, we're setting out to solve a pretty big issue. It's a very inefficient process right now ordering food, restaurants ordering food, inventory for their kitchen. So that's where Choco steps in and we're trying to digitalize this space. Um, but with that, we have a larger goal. Um, and so if you wanna go to the next slide. Oh. Choco, let's go <laughs> uh, But we wanna enable a sustainable food system through digitalizing this, this niche area for restaurants, for suppliers, where we're hoping to eliminate food waste through the elimination of, of human error. Um, so we're on a mission to enable food to move around the planet efficiently and waste-free, also by allowing restaurants and suppliers to make data-driven decisions. Um, once these businesses adopt this new technology, we can create a very seamless and a genuinely digital food system. Um, so that's a quick rundown of Choco. We'll, we'll talk more about Choco, the culture, roles we have open down the line, but I'd love to pass, uh, pass it to Chris. Um, who's going to give you a rundown of our sales overview today, or our skills overview. So take it right, Chris. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Zach. Um, nice to see everybody today. So thanks for joining us. Um, and for those of you watching, I'm Chris Ray. I'm our head of buyer here uh, in the United States at Choco. So anybody who's selling to restaurants or supporting our restaurants, uh, all those teams um, are my responsibility. So uh, today I want to talk a little bit about some of our, with our skills overview, um, in terms of some basics around pitching and discovery questions and, and really a lot of this stuff too, um, you know, I use it in my daily life. It's not just about like selling isn't just about trying to persuade somebody to buy something from you, but you know, the art of persuasion can be used pretty much like anywhere throughout your career, whether you want to get into sales or not. So let's talk through a few of the basics. 
So in terms of how we have our typical sales process uh, that you'll see pretty much at any organization is it's all going to start with prospecting and awareness. You got to find the people who are actually going to be interested in your product. We call this top funnel. And so you have your sales funnel, you sort of comes down. So at the top is like all the people that you're trying to target. And then as you qualify them and make sure that they're a good fit for the product, do they have enough money? Are they willing to pay? Finally, you, you whittle that down to the smallest amount of people. And that's actually uh, the people that you're going to sell to. So whether that's coming in from an inbound lead where I have a flyer that goes out, I have a advert on a website and that drives me into the sales team or the sales team just calling out cold, calling chefs one by one, trying to get them on Choco. There's different ways for us to prospect. Once we get somebody who's interested, that's where we're going to have a discovery call. And so uh, one of the you know big misconceptions for those who are new to sales or interested in sales is sales isn't just about you talking. It's really about you asking questions. It's about you listening more than anything. And that's really where the discovery comes into play. We have a lot of business in the United States. We have over 500,000 restaurants that we're trying to target with Choco. They're not all going to be a good fit for us. It's totally okay. Uh, so we need to figure out the people that are a good fit to work with us and who aren't. So we aren't wasting our time trying to sell to people um, who just are never even going to buy Choco or use it. So this is really where the discovery comes into play. And we're going to do um, a deeper dive here in just a bit. Next, we do a demonstration. A lot of tech products, they'll do this. Someone's interested. You ask them a bunch of questions, see if they're a good fit. Yes, yes, yes. Great. Let's show you how this thing works. Let's see if we can uh, connect all the dots. Because during the discovery call, not only are we trying to figure out if they're a good fit, but we're also trying to figure out what are their pain points? Like, what are we actually going to help them with? And that's, you know, another big thing with sales is trying to actually come up with a solution for these folks in terms of what their problem is. And so during the demonstration, we're going to take all that information that we got from that discovery call, and we're going to bundle it together so they know exactly how we're going to solve the pain or the problem that they have. And then finally, the closing. At Choco, <clears throat> we sell to the suppliers. We have some tools that we sell to buyers. Anne-Marie actually works with onboarding a lot of our restaurant groups who don't actually have to pay, but their suppliers paying for Choco. So for us, we have closing in many different ways at Choco, whether it's actually getting a restaurant or a supplier to pay us or just get them to use the app. And that's always going to be our final step. So the most simple way to kind of define a sale in four steps. Um, but the first things first is you got to know what you know and know what you don't know. And so before you can start selling to anybody or really persuading them in any way, you got to know who they are, like what their current pain points are. And that's really where the discovery call comes into play. Um, it's about you talking the language, feeling like an expert. You have to be able to build some confidence in that prospect or they're not really going to believe you and, or listen to you. If you're trying to sell them a tool or a product that's going to help them run their business, you kind of have to know how their business works. You kind of have to talk the lingo or they're not going to believe you. They're just going to think you're, you know, selling them some junk and you're going to disappear tomorrow. Also, you got to really know your product when you're selling something, whether it's tech, whether it's a widget, whatever it is, you need to know the thing inside and out, especially with Choco, we're selling to suppliers and restaurants who when I first started at Choco a year and a half ago, we still had the ability to send faxes from Choco. I mean, that's how outdated the industry is, okay? So um, if you don't know your, uh, your products, like we have to know, uh, for people who are not tech savvy, if I'm trying to show you Choco and I stumble over it, they're gonna say, look, I can barely even like turn on a computer. If you can't use it and you're the sales guy, like I'm definitely not. So you've got to really be able to be super slick and know your stuff inside and out and know the solution. It's not just about knowing the tool, but it's knowing all the different applications and how you can creatively position it as well. On its surface, Choco just sends an order to a supplier. But as you dig deeper, you think about, okay, well, how much time is that going to save that chef? If they're spending two to three hours every night calling, like, how much time are they spending away from their family? How much are they paying somebody to stay in the kitchen at night 
to place those orders and how much is their staff retention? Like how many people are quitting? Cause they're like, man, I'm burnt out. Like I'm tired of like sitting in the kitchen until three o'clock in the morning placing orders. So that's understanding the solution, something that goes beyond the product. All right, we call it a disco, but it's a, a discovery. So these are the questions that you're gonna dig into with your prospect whenever you first start to reach out to them. So why do we do discovery? This really lays the foundation for long-term business relationships. So if you're just going to somebody and saying, hey, I need you to get like buy this thing. You can actually like push people and persuade them. Well, uh, where they will buy junk, that's not a good fit for them. Are they gonna renew with you? Are they gonna continue to pay you for your services? Probably not. You know, you might be able to get somebody to sign on a contract, sign a contract, but then a month or two later, they might realize what I do, like this thing doesn't provide me any value. This is a really bad fit. Or, you know, if you work in a business like we do, where we have like annual subscriptions, they may just cancel. And that just totally kills our business. So understanding if it's a really good fit is, is critical, but also we're gonna figure out the pain points. So if I go to a chef and they've already got like basically everything checked off the box that Choco can do, that's gonna be a lot harder sale for me than if not. Also builds trust. So if I'm talking to a chef and I'm just asking questions like really superficial questions, it may not necessarily build a lot of trust, but if I'm asking them questions that are really in tune with their business, it's gonna make me feel, it's gonna make them think of me more of a, like an industry expert. So if I'm asking a chef, hey, you know, how many suppliers do you have? That's fine, it's like a fair question. But if I get really detailed in terms of like how a kitchen runs its stock, like do you do shelf ordering? Do you have par inventory in your kitchen? You don't need to know what any of that means, but a chef would. And they'd have a lot of confidence in me asking those questions. So even though I'm just asking a casual question, they're like, this guy knows his stuff because he knows the lingo. So he understands how my business works. Upsell opportunities. Sometimes you might be selling things where it's five bucks a month for this, an additional $10 a month. If you want to add premium things, all that can be figured out during discovery. But also red flags. I might be asking certain questions and figure out this person doesn't have any money to pay for this. They're just going to be wasting a lot of my time or this really isn't any need for them or yeah, this person might be like really interested, but they're not actually going to make the decision. And the guy who is going to make the decision hates us. So these are the types of things that you're going to uncover through the discovery uh, process itself. All right. So step zero, which is next steps. This is the most critical piece of any sale, of any process, uh, is figuring out what are we going to do next. So if you're trying to sell something to someone and you don't know what you're going to do after the next conversation with them, you're probably going to lose that sale or lose that persuasion. And 71% of sales deals that don't have clear next steps, they don't close. They don't win. Nobody makes any money. So anytime that you're having a conversation with someone, you should always be looking to finish it up by saying, okay, what, here's what our next steps are. Here's the game plan. Let's get something on the calendar so you and I can meet. And it's concrete, making sure that you're getting buy-in from them as you go. All right. Step one, the upfront contract. I love this. This is my favorite thing to use in sales. Not only do I use it when I'm selling, I use it when I'm having meetings with employees too, in terms of just setting expectations when you come into a room or whenever you're starting a conversation with someone. And it takes 10 to 15 seconds. And you can all use this pretty much in any job that you have ever. And it's a great way to start to build consensus. So essentially, it's pretty quick. Thank people for their time give them a quick agenda, and then describe the potential outcomes. All that can happen in like two to three sentences. So I might call a restaurant and say, hey chef, thanks so much for taking my time today, I really appreciate it. So 
Just so you know, for today's call, I'm gonna show you how Choco works, get you set up with your first order. And then in two to three days, I'm gonna give you a call to check in and see if we can get you set up with other suppliers. Does that seem fair? That's it. That's all it takes. 99% of the time they're gonna say yes. And at the end of the call, you can always say, look, if this doesn't seem like a good fit for you, we don't have to talk to each other again. Does that seem fair? Yeah. Get to the end of the call, you say, does it seem like a good fit for you? Sure. Okay, when can we talk again? Well, I don't wanna to talk to you anymore. Okay, so something's wrong there. Because you said earlier, like, if it was a good fit, we would have a call again. And since you don't want to have a call again, something's wrong. So it helps you circle back and just make sure. It's totally okay. Like, we're not going to win all the deals that we set out to win. So it's just important to know where you stand with folks so you're not wasting your time. So the upfront contract's the best way to do it. I just mentioned... Next steps, if you don't have them, you're gonna lose 70% of your deals. So if it's the most important thing, you might as well stick it in the first five seconds of the conversation with that person. Upfront contract, discover the pain, solve the pain, and then give them the ability to opt out. If they do, then we gotta figure out why. And you just keep that cycle going over and over again. And maybe it's not a good fit, but the problem is people are just too stinking nice sometimes and they just want to tell you, oh yeah, everything's good, that's great. But what's really rude is then them ghosting you, not calling you back, telling you certain things. So it's just about getting it out in the open and making sure everybody's on the same page. All right, a lot of words here. We can send the deck over to for you guys. But um, this is a deck that I'll, or a slide that I show uh, our sales teams from time to time, which is the old movie, Glenn, Glary, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Alec Baldwin, he had always be closing. He was like this big jerk sales manager if you've ever seen the movie. And so, um, but my, my motto is always be qualifying. You should always be asking questions. You should always be looking for red flags, things in the conversation that don't quite add up, that don't make sense. Um, it builds confidence. It helps if you're like, you know what, that's not a good fit. That builds trust. Like people feel like you're not selling them junk if you make sure they know what they're getting themselves into. And really like a lot of selling for the most part is listening. 70% of the time you should be listening as a salesperson. The best salespeople that I've coached and trained are probably some of the best listeners um, that I've met. Open and close questions. That's another uh, tactic too when you're talking about discovery calls. So open questions, those are gonna allow us to sort of like, you know, peel back the layers of the onion. Those closed ended questions, that's where we're just gonna get a singular response. We're not gonna get more information. So if you're trying to probe and dig in and, and get more information from people, you wanna use open ended questions starting with what, why, how. When you start questions with those words, you open up a conversation with the other person that's gonna provide you with more information. So if I ask a chef, who does your ordering? They're gonna say, me or Jenny. But if I ask, what does your ordering process look like now? Well, you can't really just say that in one word. You have to explain a lot of different things. When you order, who you order, where you store stuff, how people receive the orders, where, you know, what happens like whenever you get the invoice. So you're asking way, way bigger questions with the same amount of words. All right, next slide. So discovery leak, uh, recap here. So we always want to lead with an upfront contract. This is where you're going to set goals for the call, for the conversation. Uh, and ask more questions. So anytime somebody answers a question, you want to respond to that with another question as well. Chef, when do you place your orders for this meat supplier? I do it on Wednesdays. Okay, well, is that, you do that on, on Wednesday morning, Wednesday night, is there a cutoff time? What, you just keep repeating question, 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 dig, dig, dig. Builds credibility, builds trust. Asking those open-ended questions to help 
again, peel back the layers of that onion, and smart questions, questions that are really attuned to their overall business, building trust overall. All right, let's do a quick practice session here. Pair up with each other. This is only gonna take like two to three minutes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to think about how you would start a call with a chef. And I want you to create an upfront contract. Okay. So introduce yourself to the chef, say the agenda of the call and what you want to get out of it and ask them, does that sound fair? That's all you gotta do. Let's take 30 seconds and just practice that with one another. Each one of you try an upfront contract with each other. <laughs> this isn't graded anymore. <laughs> How'd it feel? How'd it go? Does anybody want to share theirs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of told me it would like save the time and the stuff, but yeah. I didn't really know what it was. He did never. I think he should have told me what it does before he told me it saved the time. Okay. So maybe jumped a little bit too far ahead, like where we're already starting to sell before we're asking questions. It's almost like coming in and just trying to set set the agenda like, I'm not going to try to sell you the value, I'm just going to tell you what we're going to accomplish in the call. We can kind of unpack you know, how it's going to help you and how I can help you later on. But that's good. Anything else? Any takeaways? What felt weird? Anything feel weird about that? That's always the one thing that salespeople are always like, I don't, it feels weird like I'm trying to like force somebody into something, but then it becomes more and more natural over time. All right. Uh, let's take another two minutes. Let's think about, and this isn't, you don't have to role play this, but let's think about qualifying questions. And uh, so can you go back like a couple slides to like the open? There, perfect. So knowing what you know about Joker, it's pretty simple. It's an app. You can place orders with your supplier. I'm a chef. I can place orders with my supplier. I can order my meat, cheese, produce, whatever from all my suppliers. What are some of the questions? You get a chef on the phone. I want you in your, in your pairs to come up with three to four qualification questions that you would ask to find out a little bit more if Choco's a good fit for them. What would be some great questions that you would ask? So take like a minute and just put your heads together really quick and think about what will be some strong questions. We prepare to share at least like one with us when we're done. So let's just take a minute for that. Not this one specifically, but yeah, I was in the one that was that was always. Oh really? Yeah, that was. What did you get? How many? I know. Okay. Yeah. 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 Three quarters, so it's like one full year. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's very basic Arabic. But yeah, I do like a short term. A little bit. I can sometimes <laughs> hear it when like Sammy or Bridget, like I'll hear them be like, oh, 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 like oh, 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 on my left or something, and I'm like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But I I don't see me, but I like know, and it's so basic that they they know I don't know what they're saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I did like a short term yeah. stay abroad program. Just like hey. 
rubbing it in my face. <laughs> you gotta shake it, so. Um, nice. Yeah. That's awesome. It's like kind of some legs, but. All right, let's go around the horn. How about this group? What were some questions you came up with? Um, I said, what kind of problems have you experienced in the past that you'd like to avoid? Oh, yeah, that's great. That's a good question to try to actually just get straight to it, where you're like, just tell me what's wrong. Like, I don't need to, like, tiptoe around it. Like, we know you probably got issues. <laughs> like, just tell me what the problem is. So I love it. Great question. How about this group? Um, we asked what type of like cuisine or food they have and then what uh, their clientele they sort of see. Love it. The cuisine's a good one because then you're just sort of like, hey, I'm just a nice guy. I'm just asking. And you're like, oh, well, we have like Italian cuisine. It's like, cool. So where do you get your pasta? Where do you get your meat? Where do you get your tomatoes? How about this group? Uh, for us, it was similar to like the what clientele you serve, kind of like what reputable restaurants or uh, companies have you uh, dealt your services to? Love it. Love it. And not only that, like, you can also try to, like, connect the dots. You can be like, oh, we work with them, build credibility, or maybe it's like, oh, maybe you can give me an introduction to them if you have it. So very good stuff. Well, I think that's kind of it for me. Do we have anything? Was it going to be Amy yeah, next? Had a, a little, uh, oh, I think, well, we actually, we actually already, yeah, <laughs> we, could, we could skip over this, though, because we already did. Well, uh, thanks so much for your time today, y'all. Um, I know Amory's going to talk a little bit uh, more as well, and I'm, I'm happy to jump in, and, and we'll have some questions in just a bit. Cool. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, so I'm Anne Marie. I graduated from DePaul last spring, so yeah, <laughs> a year ago. Um, but <laughs> this is my first like office job environment. I was a liberal arts major. I studied political science and creative writing and PACs. If you guys take any of those classes, so it was like super like. I, don't know, I literally just took classes that I enjoyed that were super high seminar based, lots of reading. Um, and so I had no idea that I would want to go into sales or that it would be something I would actually really enjoy. And I, when I graduated, I had just worked in restaurants um, and that was awful. <laughs> I don't know if you there right now, but I just done that since I was like 16. Did like a three month long job application process. Um, also awful, but I really loved Choco from the start and actually haven't ended up enjoying myself. So I, yeah, some of the things I was thinking about with transitioning to being in this sort of setting is like how much overlap I feel like my uh, liberal arts degree actually has with like the business world. Um, so yeah, the first, my little gif that I added was like sucking at something is the first step to being good at something. That was like my, whenever I first started, I felt like Chris and PJ, my other boss, like really took a chance on me because I had zero sales experience. And I was like, I am like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I just Googled how to do a sales pitch before our interview um, and just tried. And so, but the thing is like, you can only get better from there. And part of like being good at something is being rejected from it too. So that I had to have alligator skin a little bullet point because I feel like that is really important to like get comfortable with having rejection whenever you're applying for jobs, whenever you're trying something out that's new. Um, Cause then, you know, you can really only go up from there. You can really only just learn more about yourself the biggest thing I think in working in sales is that um, I'm like, I listen to everything that everyone around me is doing. And I've noticed that with my teammates, my uh, coworkers too, like they observe things about myself that I hadn't even realized that they were noticing. And I think we're all just like highly observational people that hear something that's going well with someone and we're like, oh, I wanna copy that, that if that's working for them. I'm gonna try to do that. And then whenever something isn't going well, I'm like, I can really easily take note of that and be like, that's not gonna happen again and fix that um, on the spot. Um, and then, yeah, being coachable is like the biggest thing, like be a little sponge whenever you're applying for jobs and whenever you're working with managers and like find people that you look up to in a company that you're at, I mean, even if you're in a restaurant, like, or whatever it is that you're doing, like always find people that you can just absorb what they tell you and take as much in as possible. Um, and with that, like ask for feedback and always have questions prepared, but also like already have your own solutions. So those questions that you're asking at the same time. So like, 
whenever you're, especially in sales, like I have so many questions a lot of times. I'm like, what's the best way to go about this? And I'm like, okay, I need to go to one of my managers with three steps that I, I've already thought of that are things that I'm going to offer. Be like, I really need help and direction with this, but these are the three things I've already come up with on my own. Can you help me give, figure out which one's the best way to go? Um, and then, yeah, just setting a goal every time I get on the phone, if you guys are interested in sales, like every single time I call someone, even if I think that they're not going to be interested in the app, even if I think that they're already sold on the app, I have to just like remove those assumptions and like have a little goal for the end of every single call. Like this is what I'm moving towards the entire time. Um, and then just also knowing that there's ups and downs, like some months I'm like, dang, like I can really do this. Like this is really good. And then some months I'm like, oh wow, like I really did not do as well as I thought I was going to. And that feels super crappy sometimes, but it's really okay. And it is part of your job to also close things and like, like they're gone from your funnel. They're not going to be something you can go back to and try again at, um, there will always be new opportunities. So I don't know what you guys are studying right now. Are any of you all over arts majors or like mostly business or? Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you like it? Do you like talking to people in your classes? And um, to some extent, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, because the work I do is very like political, um, bringing up politics in class is either in the news. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that that's something also in sales, like everyone that I work with is so different. And so being able to have conversations with people who, like, you know, have different belief systems come from backgrounds from you but you're able to like communicate and like working together that's the biggest thing for me working at choco that i've realized is like it really mirrors when i had to just like grind out like teamwork and i think i thought when i started it would be much more like independent like oh i'm calling my own leads and doing my own sales on my own but it's so much more like you know everything that everyone does affects each other and you have to like constantly be communicating with people on different teams and figuring out how to help and support each other so I, that can always come into play if that's something that you're interested in. Um, yeah, that was kind of all that I had for that. If you guys have any questions. Oh, yes. Just because I know you're meant to be a female in the arts business, how would you say that like that's benefited you, like getting to work with someone who's coming from that background? Like being able to like synthesize information very quickly from like, and conveying that readily available format yeah um that's a good question i feel like <laughs> honestly a lot of it does come back to just being able to listen and being able to take things in and then still having like having your own ideas too where you're not just like absorbing it and being like this is all 100 percent right it's like where can i find the parts that i can make this even better um and i feel like my liberal arts professors here like always pushed me to do that uh the amount of reading and writing that I did at DePaul, like I never thought I would write that much again, which I don't now, <laughs> but it did really help me in being able to just get things out there. Um, and I know Chris has like a really broad background too and different types of like arts and things that you've uh, done in the past. And so- Yeah, I, I, moved, I moved to Chicago 17 years ago to get a master's in fine arts and studio arts at UIC. So uh, I, was, I was a practicing artist here in Chicago for, for 10 years. You know, I did shows in museums and like museum contemporary art and different galleries and stuff. So if you're thinking, well, how the heck do you get <laughs> into sales, right? Um, but really it comes down to people who are like entrepreneurial. Like I started up some of my own businesses as an artist. I was constantly going from selling myself, just getting comfortable being comfortable in really uncomfortable situations is what makes great salespeople too. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that that's kind of like how I earned my stripes. People are like, oh, how'd you get into tech sales? It's like, well, I ran a business and we went out of business, so I needed a job. And that's how I got into tech sales. But it's also, you know, it's, it's a career that's like, has um, really been rewarding for me. And it's something where you can control your own destiny uh, you get to experience and meet so many cool people on a daily basis, whether it's like the people you're selling to or the people that you work with. At Choco, we're headquartered in Berlin. You know, I'm on leadership calls with folks in like London, Madrid, Paris, 
uh, Berlin every every day, um, and so it just affords us, you know, the ability to like really work with a diverse crew and, and create and build. And so there's there's a lot of that in what we do as well. Yeah, I mean, also like on the inside sales team, so like just doing calls. Like I'm not usually going into restaurants and like cold pitching them in front of each other. That sounds really scary to me, but that's still something I would be interested in trying. But it's like you know one step at a time. But my whole team is like. 24, 25, like everyone's really young. So it's also nice to kind of like come from college and have that be a spot where I feel like I can like fit in and meet people that way. And then yeah, also still like doing calls with people who are abroad and then you're like, oh, like this person's in Paris right now. Like that's mm -hmm. kind of cool. Like just getting to like, just being excited to learn, which is something again that the Paul really made me feel when I was here. Um, that's something I still feel doing sales at Choco. Well, I have some other fun things to share just about Choco, uh, putting my recruiting hat on. <laughs> um, but no, uh, so yes, Choco, as Chris was mentioning, we're a global company. Um, so headquartered in Berlin, we were founded in 2018. Uh, since then, we are in France, Spain, the UK, and the US. Uh, in the US, our employee hub is in Chicago, um, and we've been growing that out since 2020, 2021-ish. Um, so we're quite young and, and we're growing quite fast, which is super exciting. Um, so a, if any of you are on the job market, thinking about the job market within a couple of years, Choco is going to be around. Uh, so yeah. take a look. We're always adding jobs to our job board. Our buyer sales team is always hiring um, entry level talent, people that are you know, scrappy and just wanting to try out sales. Um, I think one of the best things about Choco is the culture. Um, you see at the bottom, the Choco team counts... 350, almost 400 now plus employees globally from 30 plus countries. So it's a very uh, diverse, exciting place to work. Uh, and it's just really exciting. It's a lot of people that are really passionate about solving this issue in, in the food ecosystem, um, you know, driving for a more sustainable future. Um, just going a little forward, we have, so we're a food tech company. So our values are cheesily tofu, um, but it, that stands for team, ownership, focus, and understanding. And you really see that in, in the day-to-day -day of every single person working at Choco. I think you get a sense of, we're all very team-oriented from Anne-Marie talking about our experience, Chris talking about his leadership experience. It's, it's one of the founding pillars of Choco that we're building out a true team, as well as ownership. You know, uh, Anne-Marie never had sales experience. And she, she dove in and owned the role, and, and now she's thriving in it. So that's another one. Focus, always just pushing to be a little better the next day. You can take that with you. You know, uh, you can take that as a student. You can take that into any career that you're doing. It's a fantastic mindset. Um, and then finally, understanding, you know, being with these coworkers that are all different than you, um, being with other students that are very different than you. Um, it, it, it's, you know, going towards better tomorrow, just understanding everyone. So these are our, you know, main pillars that we kind of strive for as being an employee of Choco. Um, I think that's everything I have. We will send this deck to you so you can check us out on LinkedIn, check us out on Instagram. Um, we have a blog on our Choco website that dives into all our different regions that we're in. So totally check that out. And then also with our blog, we have our job board as well. Um, so that's everything we have. I think just the next side is for questions. So if you guys have any questions about really anything, we're, we're very open. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how'd you come up with the name? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so it's named after a rainforest in Colombia, um, Choco Rainforest. And I know we yearly donate trees to that rainforest. I know that was our holiday gift. Um, the company gave more trees to the rainforest. But when our founder was looking into a sustainable type company, he was doing a lot of research into the food ecosystems, came across this rainforest in Colombia. That's where the name came from. So not from chocolate, but yeah. it's like the most. I think one of the most biodiverse um, yeah. like rainforests, and he wanted to preserve more areas like that. And obviously, like food waste is a huge contributor to waste in general. Um, so that's why he decided to name the company chocolate. That's kind of where this idea started. Awesome. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. As a recruiter, what would you look for? for as you're hiring new people, what do you look for most in either like your resume and do you even use cover letters or do you <laughs> accept cover letters as part of your application process? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So we accept cover letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, we accept them. Um, I think, <laughs> I think that's better than yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do read them. I think especially for like students trying to venture into something like sales, like if you don't have a like sales internship or anything like that, obviously it's not a disqualifier at all. But it's always helpful to have that context because we do go through quite a few candidates um, just through our portal and from sourcing. It's nice to see like why you want to get into sales, why you might feel like you're a good fit. Um, Zach, do you want to speak to resumes? Yeah, good. yeah, to resumes. I, I, I think, you know, you can get a lot. You can get a sense of someone, but you never get a full sense until you talk to them on the phone. So I think best tips about resumes, just like make it clean. You know, if there's typos in a resume or uh, really anything messy, that's going to be like show a little carelessness. So definitely that. But I think when you're applying to jobs, be targeted and into why you want it. Uh, yes, your experience is great in college, um, but that can be for a lot of different type of positions. If you can go into an interview and say, I want this job because X, Y, and Z, and it's going to help me get to one, two, three, um, it, it, you're going to stand out. Uh, it's going to show that you're motivated. And that's what we're really looking for in some of our initial interviews, just like true motivation. Does this person see this as the correct next step for them? Do they really want to be here or are they just shooting their resume to anyone that will talk to them? Does anyone here feel good about their resumes that they have? What sorts of um, what sorts of tips do you or guidelines do you typically follow when you're like filtering yours out? Um, well, I did it through like the Career Center. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so I I can't. It was like a month or two ago, so I can't really remember what I okay. did. Um, I, I can't remember things from yesterday, so I guess that. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Um, I think my biggest tip for you, where you guys are at. This sounds basic, let me know, but like action verbs are huge. When I just get like lists of like like boring action words, like, oh, I if you're working in a warehouse, like clean up the inventory. That's not, that doesn't really show your impact. So always sh share like what you did, how you did it, and what the ultimate impact was. If you can always tie it back to data, that's very helpful, especially in roles like sales. Like you're held to a quota in sales, right? So whenever we see people are like numbers driven, that's always a problem. That's Christian. Yeah, just to echo Zach, I mean, I think it's important, even whenever I was looking around my last position, it was always more about, um, like, me wanting to be there. Like, you should be really, really confident that it's the right role for you, especially when it comes to a startup. Like, I try to actually scare folks away when I talk to them. Like, if you think you're going to come here and, like, it's all going to be figured out and like your job's going to be the same every day and you punch in punch out like i'll just hang up the phone right now <laughs> like there's no point in us wasting each other's time like it's going to be a real show here um and, but the people that want that it's like the greatest thing in the world and there's nothing wrong with that right and so when i looked around for for jobs like i actually had you know, I had a couple different positions I was interviewing for simultaneously, like when Choco was recruiting me. And it was all about like finding everything out about that company, like why I'd want to work there. Because why would you want to like sign yourself up for a place that like you hate working at? That just seems like crazy to me, right? Um, and so that's really like how I go deep. So when I see people that don't have that same type of rigor in terms of like, why they want to work with us. It's like, why should I want to work with you? Like, you don't even seem like you want to work with me. Um, and, and that's like the biggest thing I think that, that you guys can all um, approach like anytime you're looking for a job is just making sure it's the right fit for you and, and the company. And there's been plenty of places that, you know, have recruited me for like different like sales leadership jobs. And after I looked at it, I'm like, forget it. I guess this isn't it right fit and they may have paid more they may have paid less whatever it was it just was like i'm not going to be happy here so make sure you get that right because it definitely translates in the interview process if you don't care it's very very clear totally does anyone else have any other questions all right well thank you so much for joining us today we have some uh, fruits and veggies and some, <laughs> some lemonade, uh, but we'll be here. We also have some Choco swag if you guys want to take. There's a QR code that will bring you to our website. Um, and then, yeah, you can also come up and talk to us. We'll be
hanging out here until uh, till till next. So thank you again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>